Welcome to an Avid Bookshop virtual event starring two of our very beloved friends, Caleb Zane Hewitt and David Levithan. Uh, Caleb is a former bookseller and manager at Avid Bookshop. Many of you uh, have gotten to work with him on that level. And this is his second book. And he is here tonight with his editor, David Levithan, who is also a writer in his own right. So um, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to of course, um, have the chat open. So we encourage you to leave comments and questions. Um, if you've just arrived, please hide your video feed and mute yourself. Um, and we'll be reminding everybody in the chat to do that as we go on. Um, so we will officially kickstart the event and David and Caleb will introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their relationship, their writing, how they work together, and then we're going to open up for a Q&A. And once we do that, you'll see my face appear again. And um, at that point, we were going, I will invite people who are willing and able to show their faces to do so, so that Caleb and David can uh, see the faces of all of y'all who showed up tonight. So I am Janet Geddes. I am the business owner and founder here at Avid Bookshop. We have been um, hosting events since before we even opened our first store in 2011. They're integral to our success and to our mission of connecting the whole community with books that will change their lives and giving people the opportunity to interact with authors they might not ordinarily get to meet. Uh, for the last 13 months, we have been closed to the public and we've not had any customers in our store, which is a great sadness for us because we really, really love seeing you guys in the store. Uh, we do want to thank everybody, including a lot of the people here, actually all the people here, because you're participating in one of our events. Um, so if you're a customer, new or old, we really thank you. By um, Because of your support, we've been able to pay our bills and make payroll every single pay period um, since the pandemic started. And so we know that that is a rarity and we're so thankful. And we love being able to do virtual events. We do very few of them because we really want to knock it out of the park. And we really, really want to bring you the events that we are so excited about. And this is one of them. So without further ado, I would like to introduce David and Caleb. I'm going to hide my video until Q&A time. So welcome, guys. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Caleb Dean Hewitt, which I'm guessing most of you know. Uh, I am uh, the author of the new book, Buster, also the slightly older book, Top Elf. Um, and uh, I am here with my editor, David Levithan, who also wrote uh, this incredible book, The Mysterious Disappearance of Aiden S, as told to his brother, which is for a, uh, a similar uh, age range. So uh, if you like mine, you might like his. I also, we'll talk about it, but uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about our books and some of the similarities. And uh, oh, I'm just so excited, David. How are you feeling? What is you? Good, because it's your pub day. I'm so <laughs> excited that this book is finally out. Um, it's really amazing. A few things have happened in the world between you handing it in and it coming out. <laughs> Just a few. Know that we exactly imagined that this would be what the book launch would be. I think, I think it's safe to say we thought it would be at Avid. I don't know that we thought it would be at Avid by way of our living room. Yeah, but, did, wanted to write a book about anxiety, didn't know it would be the most anxious <laughs> time in history, perhaps, right. for our generation. But I, I am so excited that this book is out. It, it is such an amazing book, and you've done such amazing things with it, and I think it's going to connect with readers on such a meaningful way. Um, so I'm so, so excited to talk to you about it um, and just like talk about its journey. Um, so I guess, why don't we start with you telling everybody a little bit about what Buster is about and then maybe reading a little bit from it to, to set the tone before yeah. my, my cross-examination. Uh, yeah, so Buster uh, is a book about an anxiety service dog who uh, is helping a child with anxiety and in the process gets in trouble for revealing the like greatest secret dogs have kept for centuries, which is that they are uh, as intelligent as humans and have had a secret society uh, kind of in the cracks of ours uh, for uh, almost as long as humans have been intelligent, as far as we know. Um, and so he's in very, very big trouble. A lot of the book, as you'll hear in a minute, uh, is uh, during courtroom scenes where he is being tried for having broken dog law in order to help his human. Um, and 
I would say that the meat of the book is that it's about uh, a, a kid dealing with anxiety and learning what that process has to be like for him specifically if he's going to be able to keep moving forward. Um, what I'm going to read today is the very, very beginning of the book, which is uh, set in that frame of Buster being in court. Uh, and just to give you a little taste of the, the tone uh, and what you have in store. Um, so here we go. You never know how many bones you've buried until somebody digs them up. Buster tried to shake the old saying from his head, but it was stuck like peanut butter on the tip of his nose. You have to focus, he reminded himself. Everything is going to be fine. Lasagna Morris, a golden brown corgi with a clip-on tie attached to his collar, nudged the latch on his briefcase to gently click it into place. He patted the top with his paw in an attempt to look confident, but Buster could tell he was nervous. I'm the best dog court lawyer in South Carolina. Buster checked himself in the mirror. It made him look like a furry red balloon puffed up and huge, so he tried the next mirror. That one made him look like a pile of sticks and not even the sturdy kind. Why did we have to get ready in the fun house, he thought. Out loud, he observed, they said you were the only lawyer in South Carolina. That's, well, true, so I'm right for sure. Lasagna gave a short yip, a gentle one, to get Buster's full attention. His eyes were serious and his ears were swiveled in a position that meant he was sincere. The most important thing is that I'm on your side. You're a good dog, Buster, no matter what the court says. Thank you, Buster bowed his head. That means a look. A grinning clown face built into the wall laughed through a crackly speaker, causing Lasagna to leap stiff-legged into the air and bark wildly. After he landed, he tucked his tail in embarrassment. Remember, don't lie. Judges can always tell, so there's no use. They're specially trained. Lasagna lifted a paw and checked his watch. The trial starts soon. Are you ready? Lasagna's words had helped. The little voice in Buster's head, the one that was still saying, you messed up, you broke dog law and deserve to be punished, quieted down. He hadn't buried any bones. Antonio needed him. Dog court could dig all they wanted. I'm ready. Juicy Fun Theme Park and Strawberry Orchard had been abandoned for years. Really abandoned, like whoever owned it disappeared from the country without telling anyone so nobody could do anything to it abandoned. No humans other than teenagers had bothered to go inside for years. All rise for the Honorable Judge Sweetie, the dog court bailiffs, four pugs wearing pointy blue hats, howled in unison. Now sit, sit, come on, sit, good. Some dog had reconnected the power, but most of the rides in Juicy Fun were too broken down to use. Dog court was held in the bumper car arena. Busted old cars teetered atop one another in a pile the judge was climbing with graceful leaps. Colorful lights flashed and spun in patterns over everything. The judge slammed her squeaky rubber gavel down three times and all barking, yipping, and yelping settled. Terriers and retrievers, boxers and schnauzers, greyhounds and huskies all squeezed into the seats of discarded bumper cars, so many that larger dogs were graciously lying down to allow smaller ones to sit on their backs. Dead silence fell in the courtroom and everyone was staring at Buster who shared the only spotlight that wasn't spinning. The light made Buster feel small, but somehow made the judge, a serious looking borzoi with a coat as black and white as her sense of justice, seem impossibly huge and intimidating. He remembered a trick someone had told Tonio for dealing with nerves. Imagine everyone in their underwear. He tried thinking of the judge and big human boxers. That might be funny, but she was so confident and poised he was certain she could pull it off with style. Maybe the trick didn't really work with dogs. Do you understand, Buster? Oh no, the judge had been talking the whole time he'd been totally distracted thinking about underwear. Buster, are we boring you? Too famous for us? No, I, he froze. He definitely could not tell her what he was thinking about. The judge's ears rotated and folded just slightly to show she was irritated. Your honor, another spotlight clicked on over a husky with perfectly groomed fur and a twist to his tail that meant he was expressing humor. Buster clearly doesn't grasp how serious the situation is considering this is his second time on trial for the baddest crime a dog can commit, revealing his true intelligence to a human. The husky shrugged and looked directly at Buster with a sneer. Perhaps for him, this is just another day at the park. A cry rang out from the crowd. Throw him in the bone pit! The bone pit is for celebrations, Sadie, someone else whispered. Well then throw him in the regular pit! The judge banged her gavel and its squeaks quieted the crowd again. Your honor, Lasagna said, the speaker for dog law hasn't even introduced himself and he's already trying to build a case against Buster. 
The judge turned her head toward the husky. He rolled his shoulders and stood, tail wagging rhythmically like a clock pendulum. My name is Pronto, your honor, and as the little lawyer says, I'm here on behalf of the law. He bowed toward the tower of bumper cars. While you, of course, have final ruling over this dog's fate, I believe the law here is clear. Buster Pulaski showed a human the truth, putting all of us in danger. I am officially requesting that you send him to the farm. A gasp rippled through the crowd and a chill raised Buster's fur. Your honor, he awkwardly mimicked Pronto's bow, just in case. I never meant to put dog kind in danger. I made a hard choice, but I'd do it again if it meant helping my human. Lasagna winced. Buster was not supposed to be talking. Pronto clicked his claws against the hood of his bumper car in a sarcastic clap. Such a hero. Buster the miracle dog. Buster's eyes fell to the ground. I guess there was no chance they'd forget. Pronto leaned back on the side of his car and spoke to the crowd behind them. We have no idea how humans will react when they realize the truth. And they are historically a very dangerous species. Our silence, our continued secrecy is the only thing that keeps us safe. You have threatened this safety buster, all for the sake of this. He checked his notes. Antonio? The sound of his boy's name made Buster bristle. Tonio is a good boy. My job was to protect him. And that's where I'm gonna stop for now. Um, thank you everybody for Ooh. listening. Ooh, that was my first time reading from this book out loud outside of uh, on the video the other day for Abbott. And it is cool to actually reread some of this that I have barely looked at in a while. <laughs> Um, uh, ah, but thanks You're getting everyone. lots of woofs and, and woohoos <laughs> in the in the chat, which I think will work. <laughs> I appreciate um, we can, it. Yes. We'll, we'll applaud we'll, when we un un Mike. We'll we'll applaud later. We've got some hands. I'll applaud for, I'm, on behalf of everybody else. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh yes, I'm seeing the, the hands pop up as the emojis. Yeah, it's so funny to me because of course having lived with these characters not as long as you, but almost as long. It's funny to hear you give them voice and to say, oh, so that's what lasagna sounds like. Oh, okay. <laughs> lasagna is actually the one I was least sure about because I describe it as squeaking and I can't, I can't do this, the dog squeak, right. but I can, I can, I can give it the closest I can. So, so instead you watch like 20 hours of Lindsey Graham talking and decided <laughs> to. Yes, to do a good impression, a very perfect impression. There you go. All right, so, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the book. Um, so my first question is, and, and I think it was very much on display in the passage you read, there are dog puns. There, there are like lots and lots of dog puns. Like there, mm -hmm. there is like immense amounts of dog puns. So my, my first question is, are these all things that come naturally to you? Or while you're writing the book, did you sort of have your side notebook of dog puns that occurred to you in the shower while out walking? Um, that you were like, I'll have to work this in at some point. And then you were writing and you were like, ah, I'm going to deploy this one now. <laughs> I, so the, the latter that you suggested, I've, I basically never did. It was like one of two things. One was either that I was sneakily building an entire moment around getting to a pun. So it was like, I was, uh, the whole scene was there so that I could do the joke. Or uh, as I was writing, I just realized that something normal needed to be shifted. My favorite thing, my favorite example in that passage, I think is the squeaky gavel where like I well, just had a hammer and then realized like, okay, well to get to this normal moment in another book that I know the dog has to put the gavel in their mouth. So that raises all these other questions. And then, you know, reminds me of the fact that they have a bunch of squeaky toys. So <laughs> that was basically how they mostly flowed very naturally, I would say. Okay. And I, I, I'm a bit of a dog savant, I guess, yeah. I mean, that, which leads, I mean, and, and if this is too personal a question, just you don't have to answer it. I, Thank you. But I mean, you very bravely wrote this book in a house with two cats. I've paid did, for it. Did you, did you, did they try to sabotage you? Did you, did you wake up and find chapters deleted? <laughs> they definitely did a lot of walking on the keyboard to make okay. sure that they could mess up as much as possible. Uh, which I, I firmly to this day believe is the cause of any typos anybody finds. It's because my cats walked on the keyboard. Um, but uh, other than that, they seemed okay. I've got one cat who likes to disguise his sabotage in the veil of kindness, where he, uh, he will come and get on my lap while I'm working and begin to 
like paw at my arm so that I have to pet him, you know? Well, I, I obviously can't resist, but it's because it's it pretends to be out of love, but I think he just wants me to stop. I mean, and the other great risk you ran is, I mean, by basically exposing dog court and, and exposing the secret life of dogs, I mean, clearly dogs must have been keeping an eye on you. While you were walking out, did you did you see that dogs were having strange reactions to you? Did you sort of look out the window and see dogs monitoring your actions? I mean, I want to answer this with a joke, but the completely serious answer is that every time I'm on a walk now and a dog barks at me, a little tiny piece <laughs> of my heart is like, this is my fault. <laughs> it is it is running to the edge of its yard and barking because it's furious with what I have done, either because I misrepresented them or because I revealed the truth. <laughs> I do think it like way, way more than is probably healthy. So, so one of the, which was very much in evidence in the passage that you just read, I mean, one of the great joys of the book is that, I mean, Buster is a really fun central character um, who you come to love, and, and certainly a lot of the dog punnery comes in terms of him, but at the same time, you have a large, vibrant cast of supporting dog characters who each certainly have their own personality. Um, so I think I know the answer, but I'm, I'm curious to see what the answer is. So of this supporting cast, of all the other dogs besides Buster... Yeah, you know. ...favorite <laughs> Frank. Uh, my absolute favorite character to write, and maybe my favorite character to write ever, is there is a dog in this book named JPEG, yes. um, who is who is a uh, a hacker is her primary thing, and her uh, she's she's known for a lot of things to do with technology. A big thing that I really like about her in a world building sense is that she's one of the people responsible for developing accessible modern technology for dogs. So like as we've developed cell phones and laptops and things like that, she uh, she has figured out ways to make it easier for dogs to uh, 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 type and, and use those tools. Uh, and I think my favorite part of the book is a, is a chat room sequence about halfway through, which I think of as the time where it really, for me, I started to really, really get the world was during this uh, chat room sequence between Buster and JPEG, where you get to see how she acts. Um, while I'm on the subject, I should bring up a funny uh, origin for JPEG's name. Uh, there was a uh, a video game that came out a couple of years ago now that was a video game that was about like flying jet planes, basically, but it became kind of well known because it had uh, some scenes in it with featuring a dog like next to a plane while people were talking. And the dog in the game is just a flat image in this like three dimensional game. And so for a while, people started referring to this like flat image dog that you would see in the corner as JPEG dog, like the JPEG dog. <laughs> Uh, and I, so that's just, I don't even remember the name of the game now, but that was why it happened around the time when I was thinking about this. Yeah. Yeah. And this is strangely, ultimately a craft question because I'm curious, JPEG strikes me as the kind of character who pops up and then basically demands to be in the book more. Like, did you, did you expect her to be as, as large a role or have as large a role? Or was it sort of, once you started writing her, you were like, I need to use her more. Um, so actually, in the case of JPEG, uh, so you, I mean, you know, because we've talked about this, like my first thought in the dog world was very much uh, aimed toward this idea of like a team of dogs coming together to do something related to crime, like heisting or something like that. And there's still there's still some touches of that in here. Like that's how we got to this courtroom. That's how we got to this. And from the beginning, like the most iconic member of any crime team to me is the hacker. So she, that that concept of like having the dog that hacks on a computer was like in my head before I even wrote one word of the book. Um, but how well she ended up illustrating the world for me enough that I wanted to keep bringing her back and playing with her, that was a huge surprise, yeah. Um, and her, which we can't really talk about, but, and her like grown prominence in the sequel is also due to that, I think, falling in love with her. So let's, let's move to, so the more, the, the one thing, or one of the things I very much love about this book is that it mixes this humor and kid-friendly dog world with actual real life issues um, and real life things that kids are dealing with. And, and specifically, as you mentioned earlier, Tonio and his anxiety. Um, and that, that, again, Buster is a device 
to to help somebody sort of guide through coming to grips with what he's up against and and learning how to cope, not to cure, but to cope. And so let's talk about that aspect of it. Because I think, again, I know obviously that there, there was sort of a personal journey alongside the character for you. Um, and that sort of when you started writing the book, you, you didn't understand necessarily how much this piece would mean to you. So could you talk about sort of writing about that, especially for this age level and sort of what connections you have? Yeah. Um, so for me, my journey with thinking about mental health uh, sort of like started in earnest after I left uh, college. I had not really considered how my, the way that my mind worked might be affecting my behavior and my thoughts at, at all. I was very much a like, like straight ahead uh, kind of uh, personality up to that point, I guess, or I thought that I was. Um, and it wasn't until after I graduated from college and I, I hit a point where I was, uh, I was very, very, I was very, very anxious. And on top of that, I was very depressed. And I realized like, oh, I could go to, I could actually go to therapy for this. I had a doctor tell me like, oh, maybe you're depressed. Like maybe this is something you should think about. Um, and I had never thought of it before. And it was one of those things where someone says it to you. And like the second it was said to me, I was just like bawling. And that's all it took. It was just like, it was just like having a sentence given to me of like, you might be depressed. And it was like all these things I had heard about, but not allowed to think about as being connected to me sort of came like crashing in. Uh, and then in my therapy experience after that, which I felt was very successful and very powerful for me, um, had a lot of things in it that I was like, this is just ways to exist. <laughs> like, this is just like a way that we should be taught to uh, to think about our own heads. The, the, the simplest and silliest one to say out loud maybe uh, is just the fundamental uh, idea that when you think something, it doesn't have to be true. Like that, obviously, like if you're thinking about that for very long, that feels obvious. Like, yeah, you can think of something that you believe that someone else doesn't believe. Uh, you can think of something that you uh, don't have all the evidence for, so you think it's true, that sort of thing. That particular sentence though, that like my thoughts could be false, most especially about me, um, was revelatory, like completely revelatory. That like, oh, just because I thought like, I'm stupid or just because I thought I don't know what I'm doing doesn't actually mean that it comes from anywhere. Uh, and there are other things like that that were tied into my therapy that I think we could teach people as as early as kindergarten, um, but I don't really write for people as early as kindergarten. So I decided to try to do it for uh, this age range uh, because I think all of the concepts that you learn in therapy, even as an adult are already, they're already completely digestible at that age. So can you talk a little about, I mean, again, because we can assume it's launch day, so nobody has read the book yet. So to what 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 is Tonio's journey in the book? I mean, what what were what did you want to convey to kid readers through Tonio? Yeah. Uh, so Tonio at the beginning of this book uh, has had a little bit of a uh, a crisis, and he explains pretty early on that he's had a building of his anxiety over time that started as a uh, sort of just discomfort with crowds and discomfort with speaking uh, in any like pre presentational kind of form that developed into like any time there was pressure on him, he started to have uh, larger anxiety attacks. He started dealing with panic attacks, which are sort of a separate thing that can, that don't necessarily have to be connected with anxiety, but for him tend to be. Um, and uh, at the beginning, very, very beginning of the book, he has decided that he doesn't want to return to school the next year because he has uh, had a very, very embarrassing panic attack that led to him throwing up on somebody uh, at the very, very end of the year. And so his like conversation with his parents where he was like, I don't, I don't want to go back led to uh, a little tiny bit, I would say of like a, a, uh, a desperation from the people around him, right? Like, what do we have to do to fix this? Like, how do we, uh, how do we get him back on track, on the track that we all think everybody needs to be on <laughs> when they're at that age? Um, and at, Tonio doesn't quite believe that there's anything he can do about it. He has seen himself fall and he imagines, just like we tend to do with patterns, he imagines that he's just gonna keep getting worse. Um, and through help with Buster, who I see most importantly as somebody who is just completely willing to pay attention to him in a way that is like hard for any of us to do for anybody else in reality, but with fiction was able to give a character who's a person and who is like totally 
interested and invested in your help and helping you. Um, to show Tonio that it is possible for that pattern to not continue, um, but that it could maybe be just as dangerous to imagine that it needs to become perfect for that to be uh, to be valuable. Um, and uh, because I think that that was something that was really heartbreaking for me in my process was hearing from my, you know, my doctors and my therapists, this thing that is like, this is going to be with you forever. Um, and at first it was really, really devastating. And then when I began to realize like, oh no, it's something that I can keep dealing with. It's something that I can keep learning about. Uh, it became very empowering and cool to be like, okay, I can learn that this is a piece of myself, just like every other part of my personality. Um, and because I, I have seen my fair share of narratives that tend to think that that kind of, um, that kind of problem needs to be fixed for the story to be over. <laughs> and I think that, uh, and I think that it's, uh, super, uh, super exciting to be able to tell a story about Tonio uh, that first of all doesn't end with this book, but also doesn't end, you know, uh, ever and doesn't pretend like it's going to, but still shows how you can make it better. Yeah. No, I think, and, and I think it's, it, it is part of a really wonderful movement in Kit Lit right now, where I think we are seeing more stories about mental health that are trying to be as, as truthful and honest as possible. I don't think there's any any hesitation anymore that oh well we we can't talk about this with children or oh no that's too mature to to deal with i think there are a lot of novels that really want to engage most of them don't engage while also having a dog court um <laughs> but, I, but again that that's the joy of the book is that you are still you're very seriously engaging in these things and and teaching kids like tonio and the kids around them about what that's like without having to compromise the fun of the story, which is a pretty amazing balance to be able to strike. That's and I might nice add, I think. a balance that many of their views have, have complimented <laughs> you on. Um, getting to a less serious topic, and then I also know that you wanted to talk to me about my book and I'm just not letting you. Um, I, I acknowledge that. And after this question, I will, I will talk a little bit about my book. But I, I do have to, I mean, as your editor, I, I will say like, Dog humor, I, can, I, I got that. Mental health, I can edit that. Probably the hardest thing in the book for me to edit is you, one of the things that Tonio ultimately excels at is he, he finds basically a, a, a place where he belongs in the back of a gaming store um, playing <laughs> a, a fantasy card game. I'm sure there's a better word for it um, that is, of your own invention, unless you totally cribbed it and I was just too stupid to realize that you were plagiarizing it. Um, <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that and about like basically inventing all these fictional card systems for a fictional world? Yeah, uh, yes, it's very, very funny. It's almost like uh, a, a, the thing that I heard from people every once in a while from Top Elf, uh, that was a very big surprise to me, was people saying, I loved the book. I'm not a gamer. <laughs> And it came up enough times in Top Elf that was very, I was like, huh, I didn't really think I was doing a game story. Uh, but then with this one, I was like, uh, okay, I'm gonna do a game story. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was tied very directly for me in, uh, the, the word that I use is a trading card game. Yeah, it's a trading card game. Um, it's called Beam Blade, which started as a lightsaber joke. It's just, <laughs> uh, and then uh, it is a, it is sort of a uh, mashup of details from Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, both of which are also referenced in the book very directly as if they sort of exist as well. Um, but uh, it is imagined as an extremely popular card game, card game on the scale of Magic the Gathering. Um, and I, it's funny for you to say that it was the most difficult thing to edit. I think, uh, I think I've, I've already heard from a few people who are like, I loved, loved that you were feeling yourself with that one, like really loving. <laughs> Uh, all the card game stuff, but uh, uh, but I didn't quite get it. Um, the for me, games have always been tied really, really closely to my identity and to my understanding of how to connect with other people. Uh, even looking back at my history in theater, like the thing that I was doing, like in theater was role-playing, which was uh, like, or I, I connected it mentally or thought about it mentally most as role-playing, which I connected to the tabletop games I was doing. And 
my like socializing of choice was to be like sitting at a game table and like solving a problem with a group of people. Uh, it still is. It's still the way that I spend most of my uh, my leisure time. Um, and I think that there are, it is one of those things that maybe I'm, maybe I'm totally off base with this, that I think people think of as a, a, an activity that you do that is uh, very like internal and like uh, personal, like gaming. It's like a thing that, that uh, wraps you up in yourself and you're like, whether it's locked into a screen or, or locked onto a board or whatever. But I have always experienced gaming as this like immensely and powerfully social thing. Uh, and so when I was thinking about like, what are the environments where anxiety might uh, make it hard for you to engage with something fully, but also where the activity itself could really help you with anxiety, I, I went immediately to games because that's been my thing. That's how I relate to new people. That's how I, uh, so it, it had to be a part of the book for me. Um, and also just because I love, uh, I love thinking of silly fantasy things and one-line jokes. So I got to throw a bunch of one-line jokes in the book for it. So that's the main, that's the okay. main thing. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Well, I want to tell the audience, again, put your questions in the chat. We will happily, happily answer as many questions as you'd like. Uh, this is not just meant for us to be talking to each other. We would like to hear from you as well and your questions. So again, put them in the chat. And then Janet will be coming back on in a few minutes to ask whatever questions you put in there. So, But first, I'm going to sure. make you talk about your book. All right, but uh -huh. first, first, you will make me talk about my book. <laughs> so my, uh, so I absolutely love The Mysterious Disappearance of Aiden S. Asshole to his brother. Speaking of which, I uh, Avid has had a lot of signed copies, so they might still have some if you haven't already ordered yours. Um, but in a, uh, I have a couple of questions for you that are sort of along a similar vein. Um, but one of them is like, I connect this to uh, your uh, one of your most popular series, period, uh, the Everyday series that you wrote for young adult, and how both of them are. Uh, sort of like the everyday much more like has a much, much higher like fantasy sci-fi element, I would say. Mm -hmm. And, but they're both kind of light fantasy where you have like taken a, uh, a flavor and like sprinkled it uh, over your uh, incredible uh, like emotional and touching personal stories. But I'm curious, like how, uh, how what, when does, when does a fantasy idea for you, someone who mostly writes realistic stories, when does a fantasy idea, like, what makes it latch on for you? What made this one in every day, like, a good enough idea for you personally that you were like, yes, I have to, I have to do this. I have to build a story around it. I mean, again, I, it's, it's the concept. I mean, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm a premise-driven writer. So for every day, it was, what would it be like to wake up in a different body, in a different life every day? For this book, without giving too much away, it is, basically what if your brother disappeared for six days and came back telling a fantastical story that nobody believed but he really wanted you to believe would you believe him would you not could it be true is it not true um and what is the nature of truth through that and so again i i would never consciously sit down to write a fantasy novel <laughs> just because i don't think that's how my writing writing brain works i think i I sit down to write a novel based on a premise and then I write it as realism, even if it has fantastical elements to it. I didn't really honestly think of every day as speculative fiction until a speculative fiction author read it and was like, oh, you finally wrote speculative fiction. I was like, oh, I guess I did. <laughs> um, this Aiden S, obviously I was much more conscious of the tradition that I was writing into, mm -hmm. but I was, the whole point of the book is that it is, one step removed from that tradition and you don't know whether it is storytelling or reality on the fantasy side um and that again i think is as far as i would go but we'll see um i can't imagine constructing a, a world in my head it's just not <laughs> the way that my writing brain works um so again never say never but but so usually it is the realistic elements or the thematic premise that draws me into doing something a little unusual and not hard realism. 
It's so funny to hear you say that you don't want to sit down and build a world. I know you've talked before to me about how your writing process is often like sitting down, drafting straight through and just like doing it while you're there. My like procrastination method is world building. So I always have way too much of it because instead of sitting down to write, um, I just, you just must be so disciplined to be able to not <laughs> sit there and build a whole world. Um, uh, it's the first time that a refusal to outline or think about your books, except when you're writing them is viewed as discipline, but I'll take that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'm um, and uh, my, man, it is hard because I don't want to spoil absolutely anything about this book. It is like, uh, it is incredibly touching and even things as like down to the level of like what phrases go in what chapters and like how the chapters are structured is like stuff that feels like I don't want to spoil it. Um, but I, uh, I do want to ask uh, both, you asked me about like how, how personal the anxiety was to me and like what my uh, connection to it was as I was writing. And I'm curious in this story, is there something that you can name or a feeling or a goal you had that feels most directly connected to you, like who you are and what, like what part of this was like personal to you and why you wanted to write this one? Are you able to? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I mean, the easy answer is it's it's about brothers and I have a brother and it's about, I mean, very much it is about those four family members around the kitchen table, like the mother, mm -hmm. the father and the two brothers. And that dynamic, especially when the world is sort of turning around you. Um, and again, it's, it's, I wouldn't direct, directly link it to my brother or to my family, but definitely to that dynamic and how important families are. I think that certainly is a part of it. Um, and certainly I, I wrote it, it was the first book I wrote after my dad died. And certainly that was a part of it as well. Again, probably to a degree that I don't, don't realize yet and will <laughs> realize 10 years later when I read the book and I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, I very consciously, I mean, I was working on a very research intensive, very depressing idea. And I was like, you know what? I just wanna make stuff up. I want to just <laughs> write a book where I can sit down and yeah. And so that certainly inspired it. But again, I don't know that it's personal. And honestly, for me, it is extraordinarily rare for me to go into a book knowing what the personal link is. Um, it is much more likely for me to be writing the book or after I write the book, to read it and be like, oh, I, I can see what parts of my life that I put in there. Mm -hmm. um, and again, everybody's writing brain works in a different way, but that's that's how mine does. It just sort of, I tricked myself into putting myself in there. That's so good to hear too, because the family in your book really is like so real and so well done. I love, love, love. Okay. I love them and all of their relationships to each other. Um, okay, well, I won't make you do any more. We can hear right, some no, I appreciate questions. this. And, and again, keep the questions coming in the chat. Yeah. Um, up, oh, Janet has arrived. It's like Hello. a return. There she is. <laughs> Welcome. I'm gonna. These are really good questions. Um, and I think one of the reasons people didn't start posting them sooner is because they were really engrossed in that conversation we all just got to hear. I kind of forgot that I was at work, and then looked up and realized I had to <laughs> look at <laughs> that. So, <laughs> thank you. That was really lovely and insightful. Um, so my first question for you comes from. Taylor Solomon, who I know Caleb knows. Taylor, hello. Um, she said, one of the things I loved about Top Elf and what made me so excited about Buster is that the world building is so good. What would be Caleb's dream world to build or is it one he's already built? Ooh, okay. Uh, I, man, I feels like, it feels like a, I have, I do have a dream world to build but I'll have to talk about it in the vaguest, in some vague terms. The big thing for me is that I have not yet done a like fully second world, like fantasy sci-fi uh, idea. Um, and Buster is honestly getting there. Like the Buster world is, even though it's very realistic, the details of it have become complex enough in my head that it feels like a completely different history. Uh, but it's more like alternate history than it is uh, second world. And so my, my big, big dream is to do something like that, something that's like fully in another, in another planet and just like really, really chew on uh, that kind of world building. And I'm hoping to do that soon. We'll be here. We'll throw a party for you when you're So exciting. 
Um, so here's a question from Austin Jenkins. Uh, can Austin. either of you talk about some of your experiences writing the parents trying to help or fix the difficulties their kids are going through? Uh, I definitely want to hear David into this too. Um, but I, uh, so for me, writing the parents is funny because like I, uh, sometimes it feels more like I'm writing me and my friends, right? Because I'm thinking about the age ranges and how, uh, and how like, when I'm writing a parent, I have to be thinking about like where my life is at and where what my experience with my parents has been. Um, and in this book especially, uh, I thought a lot about how anxiety doesn't really come from nowhere. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that something uh, hugely traumatic has happened to you or that you have gone through this like, uh, this major spotlight event that made you super anxious or, or started your depression or whatever. It can come just from the fact that like you and all of your family members for, <laughs> for hundreds of years have all been especially anxious people. And when you are uh, all sort of swirling around together, you can sometimes feed that in each other. Um, and so I had to come at it from the perspective of like the traits that Tonio has, his parents also have to have a little bit too. Um, and the, with his parents specifically, they're both people who I think are very, very caring and very, very interested in helping their child, but they're also people who are very, very busy. Um, and I think that even that on its own can get in the way uh, of just like day-to-day -day interactions with people, like having to juggle all the things you have to juggle as a parent. Um, but I absolutely love writing parents. It's like my favorite part. It was that in Top Elf too. Like Top Elf, I would say like the secret story in Top Elf is like, you get to find out about every single character's parents um, and, and what their feelings are about them. Um, but uh, what about you, David? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because in, in many ways, I feel that writing a middle grade, I actually dealt with the parents much more, which again, it makes sense that obviously a teenager has much more freedom from their parents, or at least likes to think that they have more freedom from their parents mm -hmm. um, than a, a middle schooler does. Um, in this book, I mean, again, I, I'm often asked sort of, I've been writing now for 20 years, sort of like, okay, what challenges do you set yourself? And one of the challenges I set myself for this book was I did, I wanted it to, and it all goes back to the kitchen table scenes, that I wanted anytime I had a kitchen table scene, I, as the author, had to understand all four or sometimes five when the aunt is there, every single person's perspective of that moment. And I had to try to convey it in the dialogue, even if the reader didn't necessarily pick up on it, I wanted to know it was there. And so again, part of it is getting older too, that I can see the parents' point of view as well as the kids' point of view. But in this book, I really did want to convey that and show that, that as hard as it is for Aiden S who has disappeared and has this story for Lucas who has to believe this, it's also very hard when your kid has disappeared for six days and comes <laughs> back and tells a fantastical story. And I didn't want them to at all be demonized or at all be bad parents because they're saying, I don't believe you because I imagine that if I were a parent and the child said that to me, my first reaction would as well be a very rational, I don't believe you, what happened to you? So I think definitely you do have to step into those shoes. And I think one of the challenges ultimately I would like to do, and it's not, not gonna be the case in my next novel, but is to have a YA novel that does the same with parents. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite moments in recent YA literature um, was Nancy Worland's Impossible, which is a fantasy novel or a tale and basically mythology and basically a, a young woman has to undo a curse. And basically her, her the two biggest helps she gets are from her parents and they are alongside her and fighting with her. And it just blew my mind how rare it is that we see that. While in real life that happens all the time. So parents <laughs> step up for their children all the time. Yeah. In YA, we don't feel that that's as exciting. And so usually <laughs> we try to get the parents sort of out of the picture as quickly as possible or they are the obstacle standing in the protagonist's way. Mm -hmm. So I would love to, to follow Nancy's lead and, and write something where the parents are just alongside the protagonist dealing with stuff. Yeah, uh, Austin's question was similar to what I was gonna ask you too, um, but I think it's fascinating that at least in my experience and my experience teaching, 
middle grade age is around the time that kids really start realizing that they do have separate thought patterns and interests from their parents. So they're sort of teasing that out that they're separate from their parents. And it's also a time when the parents in many families still tend to think they know their kid better than their kid knows themselves. And so I think your books both grapple with that of like the, the child's experience as a human and dealing with emotions and how what the parents might think is best for them isn't actually what the kid needs. And luckily in the books, they talk about that and work that out. But I mm -hmm. found that fascinating as a kid that age reading and then later as I taught, just that's, those are really important themes that I think are gonna help the kid readers, but also help the parents that are reading with their kids. Yeah. So let me scroll up um, to Piper's question. Piper, hello. Piper. Piper said, uh, Caleb, how did you decide to write the book from Buster's perspective instead of Tonio's? Yeah, um, well, I would actually say that it kind of goes back to my strategy in Top Elf as well, which is that like, I have a really fun time writing observers, like the people who aren't necessarily on the surface, like the main focus of the story the whole time. I really like people who are able to like, from like one step removed, see all the interesting stuff happen in front of them and like get to have feelings about it. Um, and then on another, on another level, uh, most, uh, something that was a really important goal for me with this book is that I wanted it to be a book about like an anxious child that also felt like it was for maybe kids who were feeling that way. Um, not, it, the goal was not to teach people like what it feels like in an anxious head. The goal was to create a book where kids who were already dealing with that could see a character who's kind of like them experiencing stuff and getting to be taking part in an adventure. And I think that if we were to spend the whole book in Tonio's head, the tone of it would be a lot more negative because you're dealing with sort of what he's thinking about his situation and what he's feeling. Um, and thanks to Buster's like heightened senses, he has an intuition about Tonio that most people wouldn't have. Like he can tell when Tonio's breath changes and when his heartbeat changes. Um, but I, I think that if I had put it in Tonio's head, there's a chance that the book would have been a lot less fun for a reader who already has that kind of mind. You don't need the book to just reflect it back at you. Um, so it was nice to have someone be able to be supportive and be learning and show that they are doing that for this character, if that makes sense. Yeah, very much so, thank you. Um, I now have a question for both of you from Katie O'Shea. She mm -hmm. asks, um, during COVID, have you both found you've been more creative and writing more or has it been a challenge? Uh, so I would actually, I would say that I have been writing more and it has less to do with the time or like with the actual situation which has been very stressful and not fun to be stuck in, indoors for a whole year but uh i i went through sort of when we we're talking i was talking about my journey with therapy and with mental health i went through some some personal breakthroughs between the time i was writing before covid and the time during to the point that now my approach to writing feels a lot healthier and happier than it used to what about you david yeah um I mean, it's interesting. Uh, for the first <laughs> probably six months, I did not write very much. I finished up the things that needed to be finished up, but I found it very hard to find the time mostly to, to start something new um, because there was a lot of work to be done. Um, <laughs> but what I ended up doing is on like around October or so, so I guess about six months, um, I went, went off on a writing retreat with a friend. I opened my laptop and then opened every single file on my desktop that I of something that I had started just to sort of see what was there. And I found a few things that I was like, oh, I really want to continue this. I'd forgotten about this or some that I'd vaguely remembered. And there was one thing that if you would ask me, when did you start it? I would have said, oh, two years ago. But the file actually said it had been five years ago. <laughs> that I was like, oh, this really makes me happy working on it. And so I started working on that and then made a New Year's resolution to work every single day, even if it was just a sentence or just a paragraph to finish it. Um, and I finished it a few weeks ago. And of course, promptly 
totally deep six the resolution. I was like, I'm gonna keep going, and then like, no, we <laughs> finished it. So uh, hopefully, I'll get back to that resolution because it's a very good resolution. Um, but I, yeah. So so when I had something that was really bringing me joy to write, um, and hopefully will bring you all joy to read when it comes out next year, um, that I was able to do. But other things I was not able to do. Thank you, that was helpful to hear, by the way. <laughs> um, also, I put this in the chat. I meant, I forgot to tell you guys to turn on your video. So I put it in the chat. Welcome. Now we can everybody. see you. Hello. I'm really happy you're here. And I'm sorry that I forgot to cue you to show your faces earlier. Wow, I'm um, looking at all these faces now. Hooray. So if you're getting the message that your video is disabled, you can um, do a direct chat message to Avid Bookshop and Rachel will see what she can do to fix those settings. All right, so I have one question from Rainy Lynch. Rainy. Um, she said, it seems like the perspectives, perspectives you choose also allow for more comedy which is something I absolutely love about your work. That wasn't even a question. I've meant to read her question, but that was a comment and I agree with that. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, let me go back up to what Well, thank you so much, Rainy. Um, so this is for um, Caleb, but I'm going to love it to David as well, because I think you could really answer this also. Is that allowed? For both of you. Um, this is my question. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> this is for Caleb only. Um, <laughs> Do you find the writing process to be overall therapeutic or is it something that feeds your anxiety that you inevitably end up chatting with your therapist about? Uh, well, uh, I would say that, that for, I have different answers for this book and for what I have written more recently. Um, I have in the past found the actual act of writing to be really tough um, mentally and especially with Writing Buster at first. Uh, was extremely difficult. And there was a lot of stuff going on in my life at the time that I was finishing the Buster draft. I like moved across the country. I had uh, completely like uh, changed my way of life and I was in a totally different kind of place to live. Um, but while I was writing Buster One, there were points where I felt I was like falling deep into the brain. I was trying to, in the scene I was writing, explain was not a healthy place for your brain to be. And so I, in, it should have been therapeutic, but sometimes it felt like I was just like hitting myself a little bit, like, and now I'm gonna explain what's happening in my head and focus on it really hard for hours, um, which isn't necessarily the best thing to do with anxiety is to really think about it. Um, but I have found that in the time since this book, uh, I have, the writing has come a little bit easier. And some of it has, I think, come from just proving that I could write two books. I did two of them and now I can do another one probably. Um, and, uh, and another part of it has come just from the hitting that point where I was so unhappy at certain points with the book made me realize what patterns I was falling into and what habits I had that were feeding that. And I have worked very hard to try to pull back from those and turn writing into a thing that's allowed to be fun <laughs> again. Uh, so hopefully more on the therapeutic side soon. David, would you like to answer that? I mean, I, I, I mean, I do find it therapeutic. I mean, I, I just enjoy it. I mean, it's something that I, I always, always just sit down and write and, and I'm there and I'm happy. Like it's, so it's, <laughs> so it isn't necessarily what I'm writing. It is just the act of writing and getting it done and seeing the pages come up. Um, again, even if it is something, again, the, the, my next book, which will probably come out in September, is a collaboration with somebody else that hasn't been announced, so I can't say, but um, it is certainly, it is a very, very tough book. But it's interesting because even writing some really tough subject matter, it was always such a joy because it was sharing with this other author and just the articulation of it was so, so much what I wanted it to be. So again, that, that really, that helps. It's, it's always a space that I can go into. Um, and again, the way that my writing mind works is like when I'm writing, like nothing else exists. Like it, it genuinely, I, I'm there in the story. And, and so that obviously when the world around you is a place that you would like not to exist around you or that you would like to put it on pause, it's a very great device for me to be able to put it on pause. 
it's been wild the couple of times that we have written in the same place watching you be able to just like sit and go like you're like now is my writing time <laughs> meanwhile i am like wandering around the whole room just like pulling out video games i cannot i cannot settle <laughs> i have to have like a perfect day ritual to get to it like it's very it's very impressive to watch yeah i mean i again i think it comes back to what we were saying before and the way that different writing minds are wired that like I genuinely don't think of writing necessarily as something to think about, it's something to do. And I think that that again, just happens to be how my brain works. So, so I, I can't distract myself by sort of thinking about it or trying to put the pieces together. Like basically the only way I'm going to put the pieces together is to sit down at the keyboard and write. Um, so it, it, in many ways I've sort of blocked my own road to distraction because I know <laughs> if I want it done, that, that there is no halfway doing it. I just either have to commit or not. You're just, you're right. That's true. <laughs> that so gonna, um, everybody's mind works in different ways. Like, <laughs> But that's the right way. You have the right way. That's the right way. <laughs> no. If there's anything we learn from Kayla's book is that there's one right there's way there's to one correct There's one right way for your brain to work. Um, <laughs> no, no. And, um, so I'm going to officially end. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to do my fancy avid conclusion and that is going to be so we know when to mark the end of the video that we'll put on YouTube but for anybody that's willing and able to hang out after I officially end it I know that um, Caleb and David if they have time would love to actually chat with you so sorry for people just watching this on YouTube let this be a lesson that you should <laughs> do our live stream um, so my last question and then again I'll do the conclusion of the event is from Caleb's dad <gasps> my dad he asks, Hello, Rachel, Rachel labels it, from Caleb's dad, as typed by Kim Hewitt. <laughs> <laughs> as a bit of a teaser, can you give us some idea where the Buster story goes next? I have to ask David if that's what yeah. I can say. Yeah, I can give some? Okay. Totally. I don't want to spoil the ending of this book, so I don't want to like necessarily say the setup of the next one, um, but it still follows Buster and Tonio. Um, and I would say the, the most exciting thing to say is that the human world catches a little bit of wind of what's happening, like some, some important people in the human world. And the, uh, the sort of, this sounds strange to say in, in the sentence, I'm gonna have to do this a million times when it actually comes out. Yeah. The like government response to what happens in Buster One, uh, both on the dog side and the human side, um, kind of escalates a little bit. Um, and also we get to learn about some characters who are uh, minor and mentioned characters in this book and dig deeper into learning more about the other people in Belleville. Um, so that's what I would say happens in book two. I, the more exciting, uh, once you finish the book, hit me up and I yeah. will tell you the more exciting uh, pitch for what actually happens at the very beginning. I mean, to, to clarify, minor is M-I-N-O-R, not M-I-N-E-R. So if you're thinking that there'll be <laughs> lots of mining. Got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you want the... it, it's, it's, it's your book launch. Well, it'll probably be public in like a few weeks. Do you want to reveal what the title is of book two? <gasps> I do want to do that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the title of book two is called Buster Undercover. Um, uh, very, very exciting title. I love the way it sounds. I'm, I'm a little nervous to have a book that doesn't have a six letter spine. Like what's that <laughs> going to be like? Uh, this is all I know. This is my Our de on. design department, they are, they're aces. They're, they're going to figure out how to do it. <laughs> there's only one way on to do spine. it. <laughs> there's one mind and there's one book spine style. And I don't it's know how to go out. I, <laughs> the Will's title in the, the spine, I feel. That's so true. Yeah, yes. in my brain. How many, how many words is that? How many letters? I think you're, you're good. I mean, even your book, your title. Well, that's David wins. Yeah, David wins. That, that was just insane. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So um, I will invite everyone to um, go visit avidbookshop.com. You can go to the event page where you um, got the access to this event. If you already have David's book and Caleb's book, we encourage you to buy a copy for a friend. Um, Caleb actually got a few more of the limited edition postcards. They're so cool! By artist Olivia Wen. Mm -hmm. So if you order before midnight, so before 11.59 PM tonight, <laughs> still get it even if you officially missed the pre-order. So if you really want to support these authors um, and maybe buy an extra copy of the book, even if you already got a pre-order, um, you will still get those pre-order goodies, which is exciting. So I want to formally thank you all for being here. 
Caleb and David, we love you so much. And I'm really happy we did this event. I know that it's easy to think about the way that I wish it had been, but for all <laughs> things as they are, I'm really grateful that we could get together with this big crowd of people. So thank you everyone for supporting Avid Events. And because clapping on Zoom is really loud, I invite all of us to applaud for the authors. Thank you. I'm applauding for you.